Hey everyone, Drew Murray from D20 Advice here, and today we are going to be discussing the future of role-playing games. And is D&D a role-playing game? We'll find out. So... Over the last 48 hours, I have been uh, seeing a couple of videos and one or two think pieces dropped here and there in various groups. Um, but for the most part, this doesn't seem to have exploded into a big thing. So this is possibly new to some of you. Probably not. Um, Andrew Armstrong is one of the most prominent of these people uh, of Dawnforged cast fame. Uh, he mused on whether or not he was truly playing Dungeons and Dragons when he's playing games of D&D that have a more narrative focus. If he manages to play a game of D&D and not a single die is rolled, are they truly playing the game? If they are essentially just role-playing, talking back and forth, are they playing Dungeons and Dragons? Uh, the, the short answer is yes. Um, it's <laughs> it's uh, I made a video about a, a year or so ago. And uh, it was discussing pretty much this very thing, uh, where there seems to be a division in the community. Uh, I, at the time, ignored the direction that the uh, more marketable side of the community was doing. So things like Critical Role, Maze Arcana, Saving Throw... Um, just, yeah, any of these acquisitions incorporated. Uh, Roll for Mischief. Uh, all these people doing um, oh, uh, encounter roleplay as well. Uh, th 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 there's loads, loads of people streaming D&D. And all these people are taking a, a quite a narrative focus. Um, uh, especially sort of further up that list that I just gave. The focus seems to be more on the narrative rather than the, than the mechanics. The mechanics take a back seat. I think the thing to the two things to take into account here that are both for and against this idea that maybe D and D is becoming a bit more narrative focused and less mechanical in nature, uh, and so is it really a game? And sort of adding into this debate is the fact that these shows portraying people playing D and D are videos. That is a different medium. As an example, children's television programs, usually, not always, but usually, when they have someone reading a book, they accompany it with an animation, which is not the medium of books, but it is the medium of video. That's because they are portraying one medium in another. So they are taking elements of the new medium and imposing it over the, the older medium. So someone reading a book on children's television, you get an animation or you get some a performance of it. And that's what we're getting with D&D. Role-playing games are a different medium. They require different skills and attributes to perform and play through than does story writing, computer game creation, um, script writing or performance of a script it involves elements from all of these things as well as the mechanics of wargaming all of these different things come together different elements from these skill sets are all combined and so to portray that on another medium say a podcast or um, on a video then you're going to have to heighten some elements that match the medium that you're with and reduce the others. But this does comprise a large portion of our community. The tabletop role-playing community is getting a lot of new people coming into it these days. And these new people are seeing these games. They are listening to these games. They are experiencing the media side of these games which isn't necessarily the way these games have been played historically or how a private game might operate. A lot of people got into this through wargaming, and so their take on it, and one of the reasons why the rulebooks are so full of rules, is that 
This is an evolution of war games. This is a set of game mechanics where you and your friends play together. But it's one of these kinds of games where you can add in as many other elements as you see fit. And if you've got skill in narrative construction, you can add in logic puzzles, riddles, um, complex interpersonal relationships to navigate beyond just the basics of uh, combat and conflict re resolution. To make the fights matter more, we add this narrative element. And th th that was essentially the, the whole reason for it. Uh, uh, people wanted to see elves and wizards uh, in a medieval war game, so they added that in. And then they're like, well, what, what is it going to be like when they go to the shops? Um, can they get preferential rates if they become friendly with the, uh, with the blacksmith? What if the blacksmith himself gets captured? We can no longer buy these objects. So to introduce, uh, in some senses, an artificial scarcity in something or to uh, impede the players in some way, you're introducing an narrative thing. This is, this is an example that, that I'm using, but hopefully it should illustrate what I'm trying to get at here. Um, so all, all of this uh, stuff happens. It's this slow growth and evolution where suddenly you've now got this narrative going on where this town is besieged with people getting kidnapped left and right and uh, holes and gaps in industry, um, which you can then take advantage of as a GM or just sort of hand waving, oh, they, they, they resolved the, the issues there. So there's no long-term ramifications to things because there's enough infrastructure to support these things going wrong. Um, so you just need to resolve that short-term thing. But you can go deeper and have these long-term ramifications, and so role-playing takes a heavier toll. It's got more of an impact in these sorts of situations and in these sorts of games. And some people really enjoy that, and they enjoy the mixture. I hypothesized in my video about a year and a half ago talking about this, uh, despite the fact that it, it, it only now seems to be coming on people's radars, but I was thinking about this way back when. Uh, so, you know, I'm just a genius. Uh, no, <laughs> I, I just I started noticing uh, th this sort of thing, and it seems that now the it's not that no one else was noticing it, but now the right people are noticing it, and so the discussion is widening. Um, and my, my opinion has changed somewhat. So back in the day, when I made this original video, I mused that what was going to happen was we were going to get uh, the wargaming side clashing with the story and narrative side. Um, and I, 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 at the time, assumed that they were all coming from like a Vampire the Masquerade sort of uh, background or from books and just like improv groups and things. Um, and I, I didn't think about the wider community and how that was... Um, being portrayed and uh, received. Still, um, you've got the wargaming side, you've got the narrative side, and meeting in the middle for tabletop role-playing games. On, now, on one spectrum, you've got Pathfinder. On one spectrum, on one side of the spectrum, you've got Pathfinder, and on the other end, you've got Puppetland. So one is just almost pure mechanics, and you've got to squeeze the role-play in, um, especially early on. Or you've got pure narrative with a rough framework, but it, it is communal narrative storytelling with no random elements whatsoever. So those are your two extremes. And I proposed at the time that we are going to get a renaissance in gaming where these lines are going to be defined and we're going to have the more war gamey role playing games and the more story based role playing games and they're going to sort of go their separate ways and possibly a middle thing would, would emerge as well but they're going to be discrete i no longer think that's going to be the case i think that war games occupy their own niche enough that those that seek just a purely mechanical experience can play games like Star Saga, they can play games like Hero Quest, they can play Horde, Warhammer, any of these things, where, again, you can start to squeeze some narrative in if you really want to. Um, Warhammer 40,000 uh, often goes into, oh, you can play campaigns and make your own stories and things. Um, but they've also got the narrative of the setting going on as well, so they do have a narrative component there. Uh, you've also got storytelling 
you've got games like Puppet Land, which are very light on mechanics. You've also got just the medium of storytelling. Uh, well, the medium of storytelling. You've got the skills and process of storytelling through various mediums. Media. So, you, you, you can write fan fiction. You can produce a vlog series. You can produce podcasts. You can uh, make shadow puppet shows to perform at your local town hall. Uh, you, you can do anything to tell a story. And so role-playing games, tabletop role-playing games, occupy this neat niche where I don't think it's going to budge from. I think it's going to be much like sort of popular rock and roll. Um, so pop rock always seems to weave between extremes like for a while you'll get this more sort of metal pop punk sort of aesthetic to mainstream rock music and then it'll edge more towards like a classic uh, or what we now consider like a classical uh, mainstream 80s vibe um, and then when it starts getting towards a sort of hair, hair metal sort of um, like Europe vibe you'll start edging back to more like the, the Alice Cooper sort of end of things and, and further. Um, and and this is the way it'll bob and weave throughout time. Um, you'll always have other bands producing other kinds of rock music, but the mainstream popular rock music will ebb and flow between those two extremes as the years go by, just because that'll be how people's tastes change. Um, because... When it comes to various genres of music, they themselves ebb and flow in popularity. And it may very well be that the popularity of rock music amongst popular music charts uh, may very well correspond to what there happens to be a lot of uh, at that moment in time, if it's more sort of metally or more uh, acoustic um, sort of things. It, 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 it depends. Um, I, I haven't done enough research into that. Um, but regardless you've got this change happening. I think the same thing is going to happen with the role-playing games. Um, you are going to get uh, people coming out with re really mechanically uh, oriented games and really narrative uh, oriented games and you'll notice a trend overall in the industry that loads of people are going with mechanics and then all loads of people are going with narrative and then mechanics, narrative, mechanics, narrative, it'll bounce between the two but we're always going to occupy that space of this is a narrative and mechanics medium. This is a medium to tell stories with mechanics, with potentially random elements, but not always. The randomness is driven by the fact that it is a communal activity. And that's that's my opinion on it. So I don't think that uh, Andrew Armstrong has anything to fear. Uh, I don't think anyone's got anything to, to fear with D&D. If you are not using all of the game mechanics, that is optional. It, it's built into D&D uh, &D to do things that way. Um, are you really playing D&D &D at that point? Possibly not. If you are using absolutely zero mechanics, you are not using classes, races, you don't have anything there as a framework, and it is never used at all, during the entirety of your campaign, then you have not played Dungeons and Dragons. Um, Dungeons and Dragons is not Tiflings and Elves. It is the framework that they occupy. So Dungeons and Dragons, first through fifth edition, is you have a race, a species that you are born into, you have a class, a set of skills and attributes that represent your training and your talents, and you have ability scores and hit points. That is the core of D&D, &D. that is in every edition. Beyond that, if you have anything else involved, then you're still playing D&D, &D you're still playing a tabletop role-playing game. But if you never use these, these four things, if you never use hit points, ability scores, um, races and classes, then you, you, you're not playing D&D. &D. 
but that doesn't mean that what you're doing is wrong. You can still be doing what you're doing and just eschew those four things. If you guys just want to sit around and tell stories, do that. If you want to tell stories about a group of elves living in the woods in some fantasy setting, just do that. You don't need D&D &D to do that. If you want to get involved in the D&D &D community by telling these stories, do so. Like, th there is no reason this can't be, like, an adjacent thing. Loads of artwork, model painting, models in the first place. Um, I would definitely count as, like, like a D&D adjacent industry. Uh, because it's not the core of tabletop role-playing games. It's the history of it, but it's no longer the core of it. Uh, having miniatures and models and things in, in front of you is not the be-all and end-all. Um, a lot of games use theatre of the mind now. Um, partly because it's, it's more economical. Um, Dungeons and Dragons is and, and other role playing games are much more accessible than like games consoles and uh, miniature war games and things because they are much cheaper to produce as well as uh, to purchase uh, and have access to the fact that it is information more than anything else means that in the information age this is a medium an entertainment medium that is accessible to a whole lot of people, far more than it was back in the day. Um, distribution is, is far wider now. So, uh, again, I'm sort of losing track here. Um, but, yeah, if you wanted to just sit around and tell stories and share that with the world, make it a D&D &D adjacent thing. Join Facebook D&D &D groups and be like, look, me and my friends tell these fantasy stories. Because something that has always been at the core of D&D &D and tabletop role-playing games is adjacent media. I remember in uh, the backs of some of the old D and D books, Player's Handbook and D DMG, would there would be a reading list of non D and D literature. Like R. A. Salvatore was nowhere near that list. Like he probably read most of the things in there, but it was all like Michael Moorcock and David Eddings and J. R. R. Tolkien. You know, it's all these non D and D, non tabletop role playing media that influence them, and that's something else. Um, so having your your Elven Woodland podcast, uh, telling stories around a campfire with nothing else. Uh, going on like mechanics wise or anything and not referring to rules or anything have that spread that around the DD community if it takes off fantastic if you want to play DD, play DD. but i don't think you're going to find many people gatekeeping the hobby and being like well if you don't have the player's handbook you're not really playing it come on it doesn't matter if you play DD. get involved uh, i I don't know what else to say on the matter. Like, it, it doesn't seem that big a deal to me, I suppose. Um, but, uh, yeah, you can say you're playing D&D &D, so long as you've got those four cardinal things going on. Uh, skills and feats were introduced sort of like AD&D 2.5, version 3. Um, you know, you, you had non-weapon proficiencies, which were kind of that, and you had uh, packages that you could get in 2nd edition and 1st edition, but, like, they're not the same as skills and feats. Um, the, the exact selection of races and classes has differed wildly. Um, if memory serves, at one point, Elf was both. Um, you know, it, it was a race and a class. You, you are just, you are now an Elf. You can cast spells and shoot a bow. That is you. Um, so, yeah, depending on, on how you're looking at things, like, Race and class might be the, the same thing as well. But, um, yeah, if if at some point during your storytelling you, you roll a die or you, you take uh, the, the average amount of, of damage, you, you, you can remove dice rolls from an awful lot of this stuff. You can point by your characters and always go with the average um, with, with regards to dice rolls. And you're still playing D&D &D at that point because you are referring to and using the mechanics to inform your story decisions, to inform the structure of it. And that's what the game mechanics do. So yeah, um, that's all I have to say on the matter. Uh, thank you very much for listening. See you later. Bye.